at times you may be feeling like you're falling behind the curve, but that's absolutely fine because at the end of the day, the only person you're competing against is yourself, right? And I've seen people applying from HR to investment banking and I'm like, do you know what you're doing? This doesn't make any sense. So I would say you can't just set out a plan and think you're going to follow it perfectly because... Hello everyone and welcome back to Cutting Edge. In today's episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Pietro. So Pietro is currently at LSC. He has some fantastic internship experience he'd be very happy to share with us. So without further ado, thank you Pietro and welcome to Cutting Edge. Thank you Tom for having me and inviting me here today. Great to be here. So let's kick off potentially with your background. If you could tell us a bit about yourself, um, not just in terms of your degree, your work, but maybe a bit about your personal background too, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. So I'll sort of tell this in a chronological story. So I'm originally, my, my name, right, Pietro, I'm originally half Italian, but also half Spanish. But I was brought up in London, as you can tell, right, uh, went up through the British education system. And, you know, when I was studying my A-levels, uh, I was doing economics, maths and French without a clue of what I wanted to do in, in the future. And, you know, I was just looking at what universities to apply to and what my interests were in. So uh, at the time, it was either between economics or management. And then uh, I opted to study management. And that was because uh, of an experience that I had uh, during sixth form before the, before the pandemic hit. And uh, this experience was, I was working part time in this local primary school. I liked working within organizations. And I thought, well, surely management would be better for me, right? Because I enjoyed that more than economics at the time. So as such, I applied to study management at uni. Uh, I applied to London universities. Uh, I got the offer from LSE, which I obviously took. And then uh, September 2021, I get to LSE. And, you know, this is when, uh, you know, the much more professional side of it starts uh, in, in an environment like there is at LSE. You know, you, you learn a lot. There's very amazing people around you. And as such, you know, I started to become more motivated to think about my future and what I wanted to do after university. Uh, then as such, I got involved in a couple couple experiences that I can touch upon uh, when you ask me questions, right? But then I was, so for example, I was in some uh, strategic consult, doing some part-time st strategic consulting work. And then also uh, at university, I was introduced to finance, which I found very interesting. And I thought, well, why don't I combine these sort of, this sort of advisory experience with finance and see what I get from there? Because I, I like the two things. And as such, that drew me to investment banking. And, you know, I wanted to find out more about the industry while still in my first year of university. So I went about applying to everything, everywhere, every single nook and cranny, every, everywhere for opportunities. Uh, I got a risk management summer internship at a big four American bank in London. So I was very fortunate for that. I enjoyed that. And yeah, off of there, I, I've been, uh, you know, still, still very much inter interested in the industry. I've got my other another internship now for my penultimate year of university that I'm very much looking forward to. And yeah, that wraps me up professionally and also my background. Uh, and yeah, that's about it, I think, really. Fantastic. One thing I definitely want to touch on straight away is the timing of you starting your degree. So, so 2021, so we're talking about the wake of the pandemic. I mean, having gone through that and been working full time, it was an absolute nightmare, but I can only imagine going through university applications, thinking ahead, that must have been a whole other world mm -hmm. of pain. Could you elaborate on what was your experience, particularly in the context of the pandemic? Yeah, so applying to university, uh, so for the exact dates, it was so March 2020, of course, we all know that. March 2020, uh, I was in lower sixth form. So essentially, my year was the year that was, or, or my year for university applications wasn't the one where our A-levels were fully cancelled. It was the one where they were half cancelled. But as such, our, pers our, exp our like ability to develop our personal statements was very weak because in lower sixth, you sort of develop your experiences and upper sixth, you apply, right? So I had more limited experience, but that time that I, for a few months where I was working part-time uh, volu volunteering uh, for that local primary school, you know, that was you know, a lot of my motivation for applying uh, to, to my course at university. And it, it was very bizarre, these online lessons. Uh, very unique experience. I mean, I'm sure we all, you know, there's, there's a bit of some positive memories associated to it because um, the, the, that first summer of lockdown was absolutely beautiful, right? But uh, of course, it wasn't the best time in the world. But, you know, just, you just sort of power through it with your mates uh, in sixth form and 
you get through it because you know it's it's it is easy to think oh what's going to happen to me you know applying to university now but everyone's in the same boat as you you, you shouldn't be worried and that's the sort of mindset to come Fair enough. And as you started LSC, um, there might have been one or two odd lockdowns in the midst mm -hmm. of it. Yeah, the Omicron. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that was when my January exams got cancelled. Well, it, they got turned into online exams. So um, yeah. And then also my, my university experience at that point was semi-online, semi-in-person. So um, lectures were online, but certain classes were in person. I mean, freshers still went on. It was good. Yeah. But um, now, in present day, so I'm in my second year, now it's gone practically back to normal, yeah. Okay, oh, that's really cool to know. And mm. one other question I wanted to ask is management. So yeah. for those who aren't very familiar with that as a course, on a very high level, what is management and what made you choose that degree? Mm. This is a question I actually really struggle to answer myself. I, I, with my course mates, we're like, what, what actually is management? Because it's so different from university to university, and that was it, right? Management really depends on the uh, university that you're studying it at. So uh, at LSE, management is very focused on economics. I would say it's practically a microeconomics degree, uh, except you do a tiny bit more essay writing than in other courses. But I do, I do the same econ courses as econ and politics students, econ and math students, econ with maths, which is an LSE variation with an and means different things. It means that you do 75, 25 instead of 50, 50, right? So at LSE, it's very much, I would say, a microeconomics degree. At other universities, it's uh, quite different. So for example, if you're doing ENM at Oxford, it's basically an essay writing course. I know that because uh, for my internship, I was working with someone who was doing Oxford ENM. Uh, and what is ENM? Economics and management, my bad. No, no. Worries. So um, that's different to, so that person decided to study ENM at Oxford instead of uh, economics at Cambridge. Those are two, two, two very, very different things. Then other decent universities for management, I would say Warwick. Uh, I'm not familiar with what they do there, but I know it's a good, good university for it. Uh, I also applied to King's College London for management. They're more essay writing as well. And I would say, you know, I, I prefer the stance that LSE takes on it, turning it into a microeconomics degree, essentially. Sure. So definitely a finance background or economics back job. Uh, I would say because Management, I forgot to touch upon this, it's essentially the study of organizations. So mm -hmm. of course, finance is sort of the, uh, I'm, not, I'm not good at biology, right? It's a sort of the blood system, the heart, the lungs, whatnot. Finance is the pumping heart of an organization, right? And the blood that courses through it. But everything else is management within it, right? So I would say management is the study of organizations, but you're not focusing on the fin on the finance aspect of it. And I think that's something that a lot of people forget about in investment banking. So of course it's a finance job, but your clients are organizations. So the, one of the reasons that I was drawn to finance is, uh, or, or to investment banking, isn't wasn't immediately because of the uh, finance aspect of it, but because of how you're working with organizations. The finance aspect of it only came really um, further down the line. Okay, well that's a really good segue into all things. You're at LSE, you're looking at applications, you wanna dip your feet into the finance world through internships and whatnot, which obviously you've, you've got one under your belt, mm -hmm. you're looking at a future one this yep. coming summer. So I guess before we get into all of that, why finance and where did you hear about it? What made you even begin thinking about finance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I alluded to this in the introduction, of course, but uh, to be more concise about it, uh, so I was doing the strategic consulting work, as I said, which I enjoyed. Uh, I was working with a startup, of course, because we're students, right? And I liked working with the top level management of this organization to decide where they should go moving forward, right? So, and this work specifically was uh, on, on their expansion. So we were looking at cross-border strategic partnerships. So, consult so consult consultancies would do that. But uh, the reason I became more interested in, in, in investment banking sort of work is because um, Really, so organizations will go to consultants, you know, to sort of scope out this work to see whether they should do it or not. But then the ba the bankers will be the ones to, you know, actually go through with it and look at the, the 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 tangible numbers and the finance and so on, which I found a lot more interesting because of my other experiences at university, right? So that's one thing. And additionally, the work in investment banking I found to be like more significant, I would say. So um, you you would. If you're working on an M&A deal, for example, you'll, you'll be working with the highest level people 
from the organization as opposed to if, if you're working in consulting, you might be doing the preliminary work, right? Not to, you know, berate uh, consultants, right? But, but um, that's, that's what I thought at least. And also um, one thing that I did struggle with consulting, uh, so this, this is a compliment to them, it's a lot more abstract. And, you know, I, I do enjoy abstract thinking, but I just wanted to tone it down a level, right? And I see it as a sort of slider. Uh, consult, consulting is up here on the sort of abstract scale, whereas you can tone it down slightly with investment banking and still be on that scale and enjoy it, right? While also enjoying other things. There's a million different scales, right? So for me, it was just really that balance of interest that I, that I found interesting about investment banking and why I was attracted to finance. Sure, the fact that you had that practical experience with some overlap within investment banking, that must have made you research it, talk to people within mm -hmm. the sector, mm -hmm. then eventually go, you know what, I'd like to give this a go. And then mm -hmm. that was probably your segue into your first internship yeah. application. Can you tell us a bit more about your experience with that first internship? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, this first internship was in middle office, so it was in risk management. And the reason I chose to go to go for risk management middle office is because, I mean, I'm still in my first year of university. What do I actually know? Very little, right? So instead of gunning straight to, you know, a front office job, you know, uh, just absolutely laser focus on one thing. If I go for something like risk management, you're essentially looking at all the different, what I was doing, I was looking at all the different lines of business that the front office was, were doing, the risk that they generate and the impact of that on the capital and earnings of the bank, right? And as such, you know, I was really able to verify my interest, you know, because after that experience, I may have been like, okay, actually, I would be more interested in this part of the front office or that part of the front office, for example, right? So, um, you know, that was the motivation behind it uh, to be able to look more holistically at the industry. And given that I was in my first year of university, right? I think that was very important for me. Understood. And so when you started your internship, did you have any expectations? Did you speak to others? Did you get an idea of this is how it's going to work? Or did you go in with a very open mind and see, you know, how is this going to go? Let's not have any preset judgment as to this is what I want to do after it. Mm. This is where I want to go beyond the internship. Yeah. So hmm, I would say it's because it's, I was going into it, uh, just looking to learn more about what banks do, you know, because it's actually, if you ask university students, okay, what, what do banks do? Some of them that will say that they're interested in finance, they won't be able to answer that question. So I was going in and saying, let me actually learn what a bank does and, you know, find out more about my interests. Um, of course, if I, if, I, if I absolutely adored the internship, I would have been like, you know, actually, I, I would like to stay within risk management, right? But I didn't know that before. So I was going in with an open mind to just simply learn more of where I would want to go in the future. And now, because I've been speaking sort of uh, refle reflectively upon it, right? So now looking back, I was like, yeah, sure, that risk risk management is fine. But for me personally, uh, it isn't the one, right? But I know that now after the experience, which is why I always say to people, you know, just, just go for it. Try different things, trial and error and just move forward from there. That's definitely a message that would convey Financial Edge is just trying as many different areas within finance or beyond finance, just to get a feel for yourself if you like it, because on paper or talking to other people, yes, you get some broad understanding, but it's not until you're really involved with not only the technical element of the product or area you're working in, but the team itself, the culture, the workplace, just because we, we talked about M&A, just because you like M&A in one bold bracket bank doesn't mean you're gonna have the same experience as a boutique advisory bank, right? So it is this case of trial error, and I think you've done exactly the right thing there. And what I find interesting with credit risk is your first uh, internship experience, is it must have given you such a broad overview of what a bank does and how it makes decisions on things like lending. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is, w when I went in, you know, the amount of, I mean, as I say jargon, but of course the words, ha the words have meaning, but the amount of words that I was learning Per, per week, not only specific to that bank, because every every organization has their own acronyms, right? So I was learning those, but then of course, I was learning things that were specific to credit risk. Now I'm a bit rusty on my knowledge, but you don't realize how much there is to learn until you're in there doing it. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's just about throwing yourself in and what, with your team being, you know, as open as possible, making sure that you're letting them know where your faults are and how they can help you and where you can help them. 
just to go forward and you know learn the job because um i mean it it was it was very very tough going into that first year of university um no no prior no prior professional experience it, it was very much the deep end but i've come out of it, of it a lot a lot better i would yeah. say well having secured a full-blown internship in your first year is a massive advantage it's not a typical during this process mm. but it's very much encourageable and i mean based on your experience you'd definitely recommend others first years to do the same i mean spring weeks is one thing we touch yeah, yeah. upon that potentially and that's a traditional route but i would definitely say that a 10-week internship is probably even more beneficial from the experience point of view that what you've done one you've got under your belt now your second year you can really sort of dive deep into exactly what you think you might really want to do and then go from there. Mm. So what what would be your advice to first year students or prospective first year university students about applications and how to position themselves for that first work experience? Yeah, yeah. so I would definitely first say, find out if you're actually interested at first. So um, I know a lot of pe peers of mine that apply across a variety of roles without even understanding what they're applying to, without even understanding understanding if they're interested. They're just doing it because everyone else is. I would say that's a pretty bad way to go. Um, you know, those people haven't been able to secure anything now because they weren't pursuing their interests. So I would say start start small. It's, it's, it's very much baby steps at first. Um, then I can speak to springs. So personally, I actually didn't get any, any spring weeks, right? And I know the reasons for that, which I can speak to later. But then off the, off the back of that, not getting any springs, I was like, okay, let me adjust my strategy in my application and see how I go from there. And then, you know, I found out, okay, it's actually possible to get first year summer internships. Uh, so I'll try and go for those off of the back of what I learned in my failures during applying while applying for spring weeks. And, you know, after extensively trying, trying a lot, you know, I, I would be speaking here half an hour about all the different things I did to try and secure one, right? But in the end, uh, the one that I got, it was simply applying through an online portal, right? I was doing speculative applications. I was doing networking. I was applying to very weird places, very odd places for like random experience, right? But the one that I eventually got just by maximizing my surface area of luck is just by applying through an online portal, LinkedIn notification said, this, there's an opening here. I was like, okay, just another application. I wasn't expecting anything of it. Applied to it. Then they, you know, actually got a message back saying, oh, we're interested. Here's your interviews, yada, yada. Went through with it and managed to get it right. So that was the one that I got, just maximizing my surface area of luck. And the one that I happened to get was by applying through an online portal instead of my speculative applications, which I can speak to, or my um, networking and, and, those, and those sort of things. You make a great point implicitly about gaining application experience. <laughs> I remember the first time I ever had my first video interview or face-to-face -face interview. And it's incredibly intimidating. It's It's quite... Scary if you haven't done it before. There's a huge amount of pressure. At the th you think, oh, there's a job on the line here. It has to be perfect. And if there's a slight mistake, you know, that can throw you off guard. And again, in my first year, I, like, same as you, there was a full-blown internship experience available at a top institution. And did all the telephone video interviews, then got to the assessment center. And it was just fantastic experience. And I didn't get the offer. But in hindsight, I'm so glad I went through that. Because this time next year in second year, went through the whole process, it wasn't quite as uh, weight on your shoulders and everything on the line. Mm -hmm. And focusing on volume of applications within an area of interest does take that pressure off to an extent going, well, look, I'm not going to get attached to one particular company or one role. I'm just going to be flexible, give it a go. And even if it's not exactly what I want, then I know I'll have the experience down the line to change and pivot in future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would definitely say not laser focused on one role, as you said. Uh, but again, because I, I know certain, I've seen people applying from HR to investment banking, and I'm like, do you, do you know what you're do you know what you're doing? It, this doesn't make any sense. So I'd say related roles that you genuinely have an interest in, then application experience is a is a real real um, application experience is a real factor there as well. Um, so. I actually got rejected from, so I spoke about my strategic consulting experiences. You know, the first ones that I applied to, to try and get that, I got rejected from those as well. And I was interviewing with other students, you know, and getting rejected from those is just, you know, other people might give up from there. Like, oh, I can't even make it into a student-led group, right? 
my mentee, so I've got a mentee that I've been guiding through their spring week applications. They also got rejected from the certain student consulting groups, but they just kept applying. They got other ones. And now they've got uh, well, two spring weeks at the moment, uh, two, two spring week offers, and they're still very much in interviews for other ones now, right? So it's really about persevering, knowing the, the roles, having that genuine interest and the application experience, right? You can get the most ludicrous rejections, but you just keep moving forward and make sure you learn to not make the same mistake again. Yeah, we've definitely heard that word on this podcast a lot before, that perseverance and this idea that, especially if you're not used to rejection or, or someone telling you, no, actually, we're not gonna go ahead through application. The first time, few times, it can become daunting. When you're about 50 applications through, it's just a shrug off the shoulder. And I think being able to treat it like that, but still be very much on course to go ahead, power through, keep that energy and motivation is just so key. And we, we do, ask guests on this podcast about support bubble and how that's helped do you find that you had that yourself at lse mm -hmm. yeah so i would so yeah so it's, this is just your 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 the friends that you make right and yeah. the acquaintances as well so i i'd have certain friend groups that are going that, that are doing these applications other friend groups that aren't really interested interested in these right so i mean you just speak with them frequently and you see that they're going through the exact same so why mm -hmm. should you be worried that's all right there may be times where you're actually falling behind uh that's when you know you have to sort of say i'm not competing against ev everyone else right because i have alluded because i have alluded in, in what i've said that oh everyone else is the same so you're fine well it isn't really the best excuse all the time just because everyone else is a certain way doesn't mean that you have to be a certain way as well right so at times you may be feeling like you're falling behind the curve, but that's absolutely fine because at the end of the day, the only person you're competing against is yourself, right? And as long as you're making progress, uh, as, as long as you're making progress, you look back and you're saying, oh, I was better than I was X months ago, then, you know, then you're making, you're making good progress. And I would say, you know, on, honestly, if I was to, uh, you know, try and pinpoint my progression, my sort of like professional progression, during my first year of university, if I if I would take like a two month or three month segment, it may be just absolute an absolute flat line, a plateau of nothing, and suddenly a spike up, then plateau again, spike up, plateau again, right? So uh, I would say it's definitely possible to um, make progress uh, over the months, but you can't expect within two months to just be in a completely different position, right? I would say it takes more around about if you're really, really, really trying. I think I made my massive turnaround in about four months, right? When I was making my applications and so on and my yada, 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 you know? Yeah, it's definitely not a linear progress. Mm -hmm. And the thing is with an application is all it takes is one yes to change everything. Yep. It's it's similar in nature to, yeah, um, starting up a company to another extreme, but you go through so many no's and you never know just around the corner, just the next application, that's all it takes to get that job. And we were just talking about management consulting, sorry, strategic consulting a few minutes ago, um, and also pivoting to other industries. Perhaps it's also worth caveating, especially in nowadays uh, with the job industry, the way it's at in finance and in tech in particular, it can be difficult once you're one or two years full-time in the industry to go from somewhere like audit or accounting, consulting, to an area like investment banking. So although it's not the be all end all for students going, oh, well, hang on, I wanna try this and then pivot my way to investment banking, would you agree in saying, well, look, if you do wanna get those one or two years experience in banking or that full-time long-term position, you should probably make that your priority versus another area of finance. Hmm. I mean, that's a, that's a tough question because really a case by case basis. Um, it, it really, I would, it's a case by case basis, but I would say if you're, if let's say you're a final year student and you've got a return offer for audit, let's say, right? From my personal, not my personal, from people that I know, uh, they had their their return offer for audit. What did they do? They went around. They went about applying uh, in their final year of university to uh, like to, to internships and grad roles that were related to doing deals, right? And they were leveraging that audit return offer to say, "Oh, you know, to tell their story." I don't know that what their story was, but everyone has their own story. They tell in their applications, and you know th that person's now gone from an audit return offer to uh, an M&A offer now out of university, right? So I would say, 
really in university is when you get that free pass. Uh, and then also there's a lot of tricks ab around about uh, classifying as a graduate. So if you really, so let's say you've, you really don't want to work audit, but you've got this audit offer. Uh, I mean, you don't have to take it. You could go work for a, I know many, many, I've seen, I don't know them. I've seen many, many profiles where they go work at these regional boutiques or middle, middle or middle market boutiques, just smaller places where uh, it's not as competitive to get into, leveraging that audit experience that they have, go into that uh, direct experience that they want. And if they like it, you know, they can either stay in that role. And if they like it so much that they want to, you know, gun for bigger shops, they can do that, right? So I would say for in the context of like a final year university student or a, or a recent graduate, you know, that is when you have your free pass uh, to apply to these places. And I would just tone down where you apply for, apply for regional boutiques, uh, and then also leverage what you have. Uh, say, oh, I have an audit return offer. I also have these other experiences, right? So it's really, you're right in saying that once you're in full time, it's a lot more difficult to lateral out because as a university student, as a graduate, it's very much that free pass to zoom about everywhere. Sure. No, I, I completely agree. And even if you do end up, let's say, in a big four consulting firm mm. uh, in an area we just mentioned, you, there's always this uh, opportunity to pivot within the firm and go to an M&A group or the transaction services group mm. and build that deal experience. So definitely a degree of proactivity can, can help you to achieve whatever role you are targeting. Mm. And speaking of exactly that, targeting roles and ambitions and whatnot, when you sit down here and you're thinking beyond university, you're in finance full-time role. How far ahead are you thinking and looking? Um, are you very much taking it year by year, experience by experience, or is there this long-term plan or, or vision you see yourself in five, 10 years? Mm. The long-term plan is very much a sort of fuzzy cloud, right? Don't know exactly what it will be, but it's a general idea. Of course, when it's shorter term, uh, at, to, in, in order to achieve that fuzzy cloud, you have these shorter term plans. Uh, my short term plans right now is to get into that full time role uh, and, and essentially master that role. And then after mastering that role, uh, you know, you do your two year grad program, whatnot. After that, that fuzzy cloud of what you have an idea of what it may be, that will become clearer. And then from there, I'll say, oh, actually, after these two years, I'll continue in this role or I'll move to this role within the bank or maybe it might, might even leave banking itself, right? So I would say for me, it's very much a fuzzy cloud, but the, sh the, the shorter the horizon, uh, the time horizon, uh, the easier it becomes to sort of see what you're going to do in order to achieve that fuzzy cloud vision that, yeah. that you have. I would say that's a really mature approach to it too, because back when I was in second, third year, I, it was this very over-simplistic, over-ambitious, oh, I'm going to do my three, four years in banking, hop to private equity, <laughs> by the time I'm 30, I'll start a fund, it'll all be perfect. But the reality is finance, more than any other industry, is unpredictable. Mm. You have cycles, you yourself uh, may fit in a particular bank, uh, may not. So although it's good to have areas you may dabble with in future, I think taking it on a year by year basis, being flexible is such a good idea. And do you agree with this idea that once you're in the industry, it is important to have an open mind and to obviously keep networking, keep the door open to any new opportunities mm. that might come your way? I mean, that that's what I hear, right? Uh, I can't really say because I'm in my sec second year of university, but that's what I hear from my internship experience as well. I was talking to many people across the bank. So I was in risk management, but I was talking with other, so other people across risk of force first. Then uh, also I was speaking with the M&A bankers. I was speaking with some of the traders as well, right? Just to find out what I wanted to do. Then uh, speaking to some full-time professionals, they had, you know, so, so some working in DCM, for example, very natural progression is to go from risk management to DCM. Uh, I met people that had gone from, you know, credit risk to those sorts of roles, you know, so it's, it's very much possible if you maintain an open mind. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's very, keep an open mind uh, and just go from there, right? As, as I already said, as a university student, you very much have a free pass. You know, you have the goodwill of uh, people that are full-time professionals that look upon you more kindly. Once you're a full-time professional, it does become harder. But then, of course, I would say if you're a decent person, you've made connections before, 
you know, full-time professionals used to also be university students. They may have been your colleagues. May have, these may be dormant connections. And as such, staying as open as possible to opportunities can lead to, you know, better things, right? So right now I'm here because I filled out a, I saw Alistair posted on, on LinkedIn a form to attend this or to be a part of this podcast. I filled it out a few months later. You messaged me on LinkedIn saying, oh, do you want to join us here for a conversation today? I was like, yeah, sure, I'll go for it, right? And that was just by simply being open. What will be the result of me doing this podcast? I have no idea, but why not do it? It's an experience to learn something and move off of there, make connections, see where we go, right? So yeah. that's very, very much the mindset that I have. And yeah, just be open to anything because I, I was speaking with other people uh, about doing this and they were like, oh, that's very interesting. And I, and I said to them, oh, it, w w w would you do it yourself? And they're like, oh, I don't know, you know, I'm camera shy or what will people think? You know, who cares? Just go and try it, see what happens, learn from it. Yeah, especially putting yourself first and getting the experience out. And you, you got to take risks as well. Mm. Whenever whenever there's a big decision, um, this idea of you just need to be 51% confident it could be the right run, right one, and then you go for it. Um, that's a super interesting intake. And also um, casting your net quite far mm. and wide, completely agree. That's a lot um, of the time how people do secure their offers or get to where they are today. And quite conveniently, you, you touched upon podcasts. And obviously, thank yep. you for joining us on this mm -hmm. one. Uh, really enjoy having you and, and talking about these kind of things. But there's also another podcast yep. that's probably worth mentioning, <laughs> uh, Focal Points. Yep. So LSE's very own podcast. So mm -hmm. again, I, I listened to one episode, was very impressed by the level of professionalism, not just by the interviewee uh, interviewer, but uh, in terms of the guests you're able to get on. Yep. So if you could give us a little bit more background as what is Focal Points, how you got into podcasting mm -hmm. and how beneficial it's been to you in the world of finance and beyond. Yeah, sure. So the Focal Point, the LSU Focal Point podcast was started, you know, when podcast was trending during the pandemic and whatnot. Uh, and their objective was to increase commercial awareness amongst students by getting students like ourselves to speak with these uh, finance professionals at first, right? We've since diversified more and now we we're speaking with you know c-suite level uh people within you know within the industry so most recent more recently i was speaking with the chief commercial officer of intel corporation for one one example then coming up i've got more c-suite guests from from financial services a lot because lse brand the lse brand name does help in getting those financial services guests so you know we've got some we got the cao of goldman sachs coming up soon uh, we got the CEO of Kearney, the consultancy coming up soon. Uh, I've also got the CIO of Tesla coming up soon, or the former, the former CIO of Tesla coming up soon. Um, so yeah, uh, it was really to increase commercial awareness. At first, we were getting financial services guests. We're trying to diversify from that now. And really, the way I got into it was I, I just wanted to do something different that would almost scare me because <laughs> I, I was just trying to gain something some experience that was completely different to anything that i'd ever done before and when i saw you know uh, this opportunity come up to be a podcast host get to speak with these people and you know I, 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 and conduct these episodes right i was like sure why not let me let me try it you know just just because i can because a lot of people at university they'll try uh things that are completely out of their typical you know range of activities so you know you might have heard of, of some people doing like beekeeping there's a beekeeping society at lse as a hummus society as well and i thought well let me try podcasting it's something scary I'll, I'll try it and take it on see how i go from there and you know um it's been very good to in improving my communication skills also uh in research as well because i have to research these guests we also get to find out a lot about uh, the different organizations because you get to, so you communicate with them directly by email and also with the executive assistants, right? Uh, or, or, the, or the PAs. Uh, and it's interesting to see the different cultures just by how they communicate by email and whatnot. Uh, I'm obviously not going to speak to that, but it's a very, very, very niche insight into the, the cultures that certain places have. And speaking with uh, these very senior people as someone so inferior, right? I'll, I'm a first slash second year university student when I was doing this. Uh, it's, it's very much, it's a great opportunity and it's very, it, ru it runs off the goodwill of, of these, um, of these professionals. And, you know, 
off the back of it, sometimes they say, oh, uh, if you ever need anything, you know, you have my email or give me a call, whatnot, right? I, I, at the moment, I haven't leveraged those yet, but you know, those dormant ties are there and you never know what it may result in, right? So I, I really go into it to try something that scared me and to try and overcome it, right? So it must yeah. have been a fantastic decision that you're very happy you made. I mean, sitting down now on our podcast too, it must mm. be different being the one uh, ask yeah. questions <laughs> as opposed to running the conversation, like you said, guest management, outreach, obviously it's a whole different part to it. To me, there are two very clear uh, positives that come from doing a podcast, especially as you're doing applications. One, when an interviewer is looking you in the eye and says, well, tell me about a time when you led a team and rather than saying, oh, in this project in my internship, we built a DCF model, you can say, well, actually I took initiative, reached out to this person from whatever capital and uh, did a podcast, interviewed yeah. him. And that is clearly gonna separate you from other candidates. But two, more importantly, the growth mindset element to this, you're clearly a confident speaker. Um, you sat down with some very big players in the industry, mm. clearly. So not feeling intimidated, the fact that you can speak up and talk to these senior people is fantastic. Um, and especially in the world of finance, there's a lot on technical skills and mm. walk me through a DCF or all these other technical questions. But the soft skills nowadays, I would argue, is just becoming increasingly important. Yep. And it is important, though, speaking from your experience, to be doing things outside of finance. I mean, podcast is definitely related. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why you've got this degree of soft skill and you feel confident speaking. Well, I'm still I'm still developing that soft skill, but yeah, yeah. We always mm -hmm. will be, always will be. But then mm -hmm. the fact that you might be able to take a, a client call in a few years when you do your first job experience or whatnot, it's gonna be pretty proactive. Just saying yes a lot of the time, mm -hmm. I find that as you're growing in finance or as an ex-analyst and someone says, do you wanna take this call? Although it's very easy to say no, saying yes like you did to this podcast mm -hmm. really, really does open doors. So I think, your podcast in hindsight is something that you're going to continue with in the next year before you start your first uh, uh, full-time role, I presume? Yeah, I'm gonna definitely continue with it. And then uh, then succession planning, we'll just see as we go along, right? At the moment, it's a, it's a fuzzy cloud what the podcast will become, right? But just focus on the short term to try and achieve that fuzzy cloud and then go along with the flow of what happens because you can't, you can't just set out a plan a, a ludicrous plan and think you're going to follow it perfectly because unprecedented things are going to happen, right? So, yeah. yeah. And outside the podcast, I mean, you must already be extremely mm -hmm. busy with, you said you're you're mentoring others yeah. very kind and graciously. You're, you're doing applications. You made time for our podcast today. Mm -hmm. You're studying. Let's not forget that your degree is going to be very taxing, especially now that your exams are coming up and, uh -huh. and all these other things. Um, do you have time for any other societies, sports, commitments outside of Yeah, you? yeah. So, so during the holidays, because uh, I'm, so, I'm half Spanish, half Italian, uh, I'm from this part in Italy where it's, in, it's near the Alps, but then also near the ocean. So uh, when I'm not in London, I'm either sailing or skiing, right, because uh, of the culture. Then at university, which is my hobbies that are more accessible, right, uh, I, I like my gaming. Uh, I'm in the gaming society and that's actually where I met, you know, some of the people that I actually speak about finance with the most. Then also uh, other things that, that I do to just relax at uni. Uh, chess, I got into at uni. I'm not very good. I'm 800 rated in classical, right? And then it just gets worse the shorter the time goes, right? So I like chess, but I'm not very good at it. Uh, then poker as well. Uh, that was something that I got interested in at university from the people that I met, their interests and just us sort of converging, right? So uh, to reel down, I do like my chess. I do like my poker, better at poker because chess requires that bit more of a, you know, a bit more, uh, actually they both require skill, but the ch chess is absolutely ludicrous amounts of skill that you need there. And I get destroyed all the time, but I'm happy with my 800 rating in classical chess. Oh, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a terrible chess player. And before we touch on poker there, was, was Queen's Gambit one of the inspirations for chess or did you no, have no, the chess hat on it before? Was, the, no, uh, the chess was just uh, from, pe from people that I met at university. And uh, of course there was a show, what is this, was a show called Queen's Gambit? I believe or, so. I mean, I, I, nev I never watched the show. It was simply from meeting people at uni. Like, oh, what do you like? Oh, I like chess. So oh, let me learn about that. and. I got into it from there. The guy is way better than me, way better than me at chess. But um, what I do like about it, 
uh, unlike other things in life, chess is basically 0% luck. Yes, that's exactly the point I was going to make mm -hmm. between poker. Yep, yep. So poker, of course, I'm better at poker. And also at poker, you can have that psychological aspect, which I do like to get into. Uh, that's how I do make my plays in poker. Uh, but chess, the 0% luck thing is quite nice. And as such, unlike video games, where I get frustrated a lot because of the luck, right? Like, oh, how was I meant to avoid that in chess? It's like, you make a, mis you make a blunder, you make a mistake. Oh, man, that was all on me. And you know, it's not like your applications where, you know, it's all about luck. Chess is all, it's all you. And it, do it does help with the cognitive thinking a bit, right? But uh, I do enjoy chess for the amount that, that there is to learn. And the progress that you can make is very visible. You have an 800 rating, for example, what, what I am in classical chess which is very low, like 800 is still beginner, right? Um, I should be higher by now, but maybe I'm, I might commit to that more now, the chess. But yeah. but yeah, I do like chess for the learning that there is to do, yeah. There's, there's layers to it. It's if you learn the rules of chess, you can have the game. But then if you look at books, study strategies, study moves, that's another. Same with poker. I mean, there's mm. a book I'll recommend you after. I think it's called The Mammoth Book of Poker. Did uh, poker sock at university, loved it to bits. But like you said, you've definitely got that sort of uh, mental bluffing element mm -hmm. to it. You've got quick probabilities in terms of, um, in terms of, hey, if I've got a pair of jack, but then, yeah, you know, in comes the river. Mm -hmm. I'm not too sure. This I is tend pay to try off. not to compete on probabilities because, I mean, at LSE at the Poker Society, the people that you get there are very much. Uh, I mean, so you you already alluded to the probabilities in poker, right? So you get a lot of uh, people that are into trading, right? If I try and compete on the statistical element of poker i'm gonna get destroyed right so i like to uh because i'm a i mean this is a bit like my podcast right i like to say and get into people i mean not i'm not getting into people's minds in the podcast right but that confidence at the table as opposed to playing online poker that confidence at the table to play certain hands to fold when people expect you to you know uh keep keep betting because they think they have you right i, I do enjoy that element and i don't I mean, the probabilities I do I do consider, but um, if I try to compete on that with the people at Poker Society, at LSE, I'm going to get destroyed. I so. think you'd be surprised at how a lot of these uh, estimations, like I'll definitely can send this book away if you're interested, but it definitely makes it much easier to do quick calculations as to, mm. you know, roughly, oh, I'm not even going to play this hand, or maybe I will. But, you know, I, I do agree in terms of being unpredictable, uh, you know, bluffing all in on a <laughs> random hand and keeping people out of the loop. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's also a good game of risk. Mm. Uh, in terms of what's the right judgment call to make. And I haven't played it in a while, but I keep I keep walking past the Hippodrome in London and I always say, I'm going to pop in one day and visit with my old ex-finance colleagues. But that's really interesting. I think chess and, and poker are very cool areas and mm. probably a lot of people in finance will be happy talking about that during an interview. And as we're, we're slowly wrapping up this podcast, one thing I would like to touch a little bit about, about is um, diversity and inclusiveness. Mm in finance is something at Financial Edge we're trying to push a lot. Um, we've spoken to people about different organizations such as 10,000 Black Interns, SEO, uh, among others. So um, what's been your experience? Sort of, have you come across any of these organizations um, at LSE? Do you or anyone you know work with hmm. these kinds of organizations? And what do you think can be done in future to help promote diversity and inclusiveness in the finance industry? Yeah, so I'm definitely familiar with them. I know people that take part, I mean, a lot of people take part in these organizations, particularly SEO London. Uh, people think that, I mean, it's not really enough. I mean, it depends on the organization, but joining SEO London and then expecting change as like a, mem a member of it isn't really enough to change the industry right so i would say you have to be like an active participant within it that's conducting the change instead of just being another sort of person that's just following a sort of flow right so what i do personally is um there's this other organization called uh zero gravity and this is focused on uh university applications so we mentor students from disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds in the applications to university right and uh, I've got one mentee and they've secured one university off so far. Still have to hear from the rest. Uh, and that's my way of, you know, on a on a one to one scale of, you know, trying to make change in the industry, of course, is is very, very little. Right. But I would say if everyone does their part, you know, we can make the future a lot more inclusive. Right. That's one thing that I do on a one to one basis, not 
very large scale impact, but I'm trying there, right? And then um, other initiatives, uh, I mean, I do my other mentoring as well um, at university uh, for people to try and get into those in internship positions, right? But yeah, I would say simply joining as a, as a member and then not going back as a, as a mentor to then help uh, isn't, you know, the best course of action. So I would say if, if every individual did something, it would help, you know, the, the financial services industry to become a lot more inclusive. And, you know, as such now, uh, what we're seeing a lot of is uh, just that they're making uh, programs for specific groups to help them get in, which of course is very good, right? That's sort of driven from the top level. They're just enacting policies. And um, I would say another way to help to, in order to accelerate this further is if just in, if individuals were either educated or encouraged to do their own bit of help, you know, that would be the way going forward, right? And as two white males as well, speaking mm. about this, I think you touched on this point of inclusivity, but educating ourselves about, well, look, what, are some of the major issues how can we help how can we break down barriers it all starts with conversation or even all starts with a question and it's it's lucky because a lot of these banks are super international and even in universities that i see fantastic mm -hmm. in terms of diversity right so you can pick on different sort of diversity backgrounds etc i think it is asking them well, what's been your experience what do you think and the more questions you ask the more you learn about it and then with your podcast for example you have platforms then mention that, talk about it, promote it, and then it becomes a bit circular in that respect, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Good. Well, I think the diversity and inclusiveness is definitely something we're we're looking to build as we go forward. Um, so if you if you do hear about anything in LSE, especially um, societies set up that are promoting that, mm -hmm. we're in touch with a few partnerships that are really focused on females in finance, mm -hmm. for example, um, uh, BAME as well, like specific initiatives. Please, please do let us know. We're, we're mm -hmm. trying our most to, to make that work. But it's been really cool podcast. Really enjoy getting your insights, especially as a second year student have already got one full blown experience in your internship experience under your belt. Um, mm -hmm. I wish you every success with your upcoming summer internship yep. as well. Good luck Cheers. with that. Are you nervous, excited? Ooh, I'm feeling different than the first one, right? Because uh, I mean, this is an investment banking role, so it won't be the same as the last one. But in my last one, I sort of got the gist of the soft side of it, how the soft side rolls. Uh, the only difference will be the actual stuff that I'm doing, which will be investment banking, right? So that's the one change that there will be. Uh, I mean, it's very, it's, 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 it's a few months down the line. Uh, I might feel more nervous when it's closer, but I'm definitely looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, I, I know you're going to smash it. You've got the confidence. You've also clearly got the technical skills, having gone through the process, knowing about finance, having spoken to people at the focal point. Um, so look, it's been a real pleasure having you on board. I wish you every success going forward. And I really look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you very much, Tom. Cheers. Great Thanks, Peter. Cheers. Oh, no, our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, then hit the follow and subscribe button to keep up to date with our latest episodes. For more content and resources, check out Financial Edge Training's website and social accounts. Financial Edge is trusted to train new hires at top investment banks. Our courses, resources and tools will help you to succeed in finance.